TBC, good morning. We're so glad you're with us. If you are in the room, would you find a spot? If you are online, then we are getting ready so you can find your spot too. My name is Jordan. Just a few quick announcements as we get going here. The first one is that this summer we have some institutes lined up here at TBC. Institutes are really like little workshops that we have created for you to either grow your own faith or help you share your faith with others. And so I see five of them right here. This is the list. We're excited about them. Dates have been set on most of them. There's a couple that have not been set yet. But if any of these interest you, go ahead and either scan the QR code or visit the info desk at the back if you'd like a paper copy. Um, there are descriptions at both of those places. There's a, a chance to sign up at both of those places. And we would really like you to sign up if you can so we know who is coming. So these institutes for the summer are exciting. Um, they're going to be really good for us, and so we hope that we can have you uh, with us on those things. Next thing is VBS training is next week. That is the 4th. It's at 1230, so it's right after second service. If you are helping with VBS in any way, we really want you at this training. You're going to get basics on how to do your job. You're going to get basic info on how to do it safely. We're going to give you lunch. We're going to provide you child care if you need it. So no excuse not to be there. We really need you there for just a little bit after church next week, right here in this space, um, a little VBS training, and then we'll be ready to roll on that because VBS is coming up so, so quick. Last thing is wanted to let you know Monday, Memorial Day, we will not be in the office. And also for the summer, we are going to not be in the office on Fridays, and so the office will be closed um, for Fridays during the summer. So wanted to let you know, starting the, the 2nd of June, that is going to be the case. I think that's all I've got. So will you guys stand with me? We're going to pray, and then we will worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that you're a God that we can truly root our lives in. Um, I pray that as we came through those doors this morning, if there's anything that we brought with us that is not from you, that you just help us to shed that before we even start to worship here, Lord. Um, if there's distraction or discouragement or confusion or something unsettled, God, would you wipe it away as we enter into your presence here? And uh, God, last week, Garen said something about not just wanting to play the church game. And so I, play that, I pray that we're not a body who does that, God, that this wouldn't just be a checklist thing today. It wouldn't just be something we do because it's a habit. God, we really believe that this is an encounter with the creator. And so we just pray for your spirit to fill this place. God, we wanna treat it as a holy moment because it is one. And so in this worship, please, would you send your spirit to change our hearts, to draw us closer to you through Garen's message? Would it not just be words and a slideshow? God, would it truly be infused with your spirit? Would you use your spirit to change us, God? Um, you are the only one that can do that. We can't bring change and spiritual renewal to ourselves. Um, only you can. So we love you for that. We ask you to do what we know you can do this morning. Father, we thank you for your son and for um, the perfect life that he lived and the death that he died in our place and the, the way he rose to new life and gave us hope of resurrection as well. God, would, would you just make him the focus this morning? Would you show us more of who, who he is this morning, Father God? It is because of Jesus that we can even come into your presence, so, so we thank you for him. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Thank you. 
and singing we're alive cause you're alive you call me out of the grave you call me into the light you call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater your love is stronger your love awakens 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 me your love is greater your love is stronger introducing that song for us last week. It was great to have them lead worship. Good morning and welcome. We're glad that you're here. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we believe God has something for you today. And if you are new, we have an information desk in the back and we'd love to get to know you there and answer any questions you have and join you on your faith journey. This morning, Gary will be talking about Yahweh Rapha, which is I am your healer. And just as we, we sing, thinking about how we are trusting him, in the already, but the not yet. There is a promise that points beyond my faith. There is a still voice to silence all my fears. Even the worst of my mistakes are miracles in the making. Are miracles in the making. By your stripes. I am healed with one touch. I am made whole. You have spoken, and I know that it is so. In the storm, you are peace, and your love won't let me go. You have spoken. I know that it is so. In every season, your purpose is unchanging. In every moment,
thousand generations sing a word people said amen you may be seated Gary Laux is in the house come on up Gary spoke to me about a month ago and had a really exciting story we talk all the time about there's not four or five ministers of 12 there's 450 ministers and you know every week we tell you you are sent and we all we're working really hard to equip people to be ministers where they are and wherever they find themselves and great Gary has a really great story and Gary, not only is you're, you intentionally trying to live into that calling on God in your life and being open to people around you, but I love, you know, a couple weeks ago I talked about, I don't know if you were here, the Kairos moment, that God will give us a Kairos moment. And at that moment, I can either enter into that with him or I can ignore it and move on. And God gave you a really cool one. And with courage from the Holy Spirit and words from the Holy Spirit, you stepped into it. So tell us what happened and... I'd love for them to hear the story. Well, Sandy and I went to, uh, on spring break with her sister and daughter, and we went to Tybee Island, and we were uh, coming, to, uh, getting ready to fly home on, from Savannah, and uh, we uh, got on the plane, and, and uh, I was sitting to a, next to a, a young lady that she had never flown before, and she was a little nervous anyway, so we're all loaded on the plane, they shut the door, and... Uh, Pilot comes on the on the loudspeaker and he says, "Well, we're going to start one engine here at the gate, and then we're going to push back a little bit and see if we can get the other engine started." Well, that really wasn't a very good way to start. So, long story short, they brought us back into the gate and unloaded the plane. And five hours later, you know, we're we're still sitting around. Everybody's already missed their connecting flight. But we all got back on the plane, and uh, me and Sarah, and then there was another lady, Mary. She was a, a Christian counselor at a Christian school in New York, New Jersey. So uh, Sarah had showed me a picture of a vehicle she was in uh, two weeks prior to being on her, her trip, and she had been in a, a car wreck, and I, I can't believe that she was still around after seeing that car, but she was there, and and she had expressed that she uh, had been reading the Bible a little bit and wanting to 
to know a little bit about how to find a relationship with God. But her mother was totally distant, said, oh, it's just a big cult. So she was, she was having to battle that. But me and, and Mary, we were able to uh, share with her uh, the entire trip from uh, Savannah to Charlotte and share scripture with her. I shared John 3.16 with her. And we just prayed with her, and we were able to join hands and pray with her. And uh, I just, it was just amazing. You know, I uh, always thought when I got in one of these moments, well, what would I say, you know? But God led me. I didn't have a loss for words. And it was just such a rewarding time to be able to share with that young lady. And we, we shared our, uh, our information with each other. And so I told her, I said, you know, just please, you know, contact me if, if you want to, and I'd be glad to uh, share with you anytime you want to. But, I mean, that was just a, a moment. And, you know, it, it wasn't by accident that we were all three put in that, in that row that day. You know, that was God's plan for us to maybe bring her into his fold. And it's just unbelievable how God will work if you will just, just allow him to, uh, to, uh, to do it. Yeah, we praise the Lord, but we honor people, Paul says in Colossians. Isn't it great that he stepped into that? Even as we're talking this morning, and I'm listening, Gary, you guys missed your connecting flight, right? Yeah. Because of that. Yeah. It would have been so easy to be just so self-focused on now how, what I have to do to get home that you would have missed the moment. So I think that you had the, the eyes and ears to see, to hear her talk and share and know that God was at work, and that you knew that he was at work in her life. I mean, God showed that to you when you joined him. I just think... Uh, that's really great. And, and you know, another thing that, that I thought about, too, was, you know, uh, I don't think that just the three of us in that seat, you know, were the only ones that were affected by what was going on. Because I'm sure the people around us heard, you know, and you never know, you know, maybe they didn't know God or uh, that maybe it'll just uh, spur them on, too. Yeah, which is very true. I can't tell you how many times, and we talked briefly about this, that I've been in a coffee shop meeting with somebody, a restaurant, having a conversation, and afterwards somebody came up and grabbed me and like, I kind of, I couldn't help but to overhear what you were talking about and had some questions or wanted to pursue things. So I just, I love how you stepped into that moment. You recognized it as a God moment, an invitation to join him in a life he was already at work in, Gary, and that's just uh, really, there's nothing like it in the world, is there, being used no, by God and in the life of somebody and their soul. So, no. all right. Can we one more time give him a send off? You can put the mic for me away over there, but thank you, Gary. Um, love that story. I've got another story somebody told me a few weeks ago that I'm going to have share in a couple of weeks of how God invited them into something really amazing um, and how they stepped into that opportunity and got to plant some gospel seeds. So that's really cool. Um, so we just, uh, God's at work at 12th. We're really striving and longing to be a training center, not just a teaching center, but that what we're doing is equipping people, having you have that sense of call of your sentness and be looking for the ways that you can be a missionary, a minister. We're all ministers in the places that God takes you. So love that story. And that's why, again, Pat and I give to 12th Avenue. And I think a lot of you who do, because I know that this place has been for a long time and is on mission with God to uh, impact the kingdom globally. That's why we have the flags hanging here. So we, uh, that, just that reminder, part of our worship of God is in giving. He, he gave everything. We talked about that last week. In fact, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, the first fruit of your crop. Take it off the top. Then your barns will be filled overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And that he does not ask anything that he doesn't ask of me because his first, his only son, his first fruit, so to speak, figuratively, that he gave everything. So we want to be generous people. So if uh, just a reminder, I think most of us give online or give electronically, but some of you in the boxes, the reminder, those are there. If you're here visiting, we don't ask you to give. That's something that we um, who are here and planted here and committed that we do. So we want to take a minute and pray. We had in first service, the Christian challenge team that's heading off tomorrow morning to a, for a mission trip for about six weeks in Asia. And we want to be in prayer for them. It's Ian, Bailey, Sammy, Ian, Bailey, Sammy, Zach, and um, from Nebraska, Malia from Nebraska, thank you, who's going to be joining their team. And they were here, and we got to pray for them. A group of us prayed 
over them between services. So we want to pray for that group. And we'll be giving you updates through the summer and reminders to pray for them. Pray also for Faith Coleman. She's still a lot on our hearts and longing for God to bring healing for her and to, to lift her body up. And I know you know other needs, things that are on your heart you bring today. So we want to take a minute, go to the Lord in prayer, pray for these things. We also want to just ask God to speak to us as we worship by having ears to hear his word and what the spirit speaks, that we'll have hands to put it to practice, right? So let's take a minute and go to the Lord in prayer. So, Lord, we come to your word now, and we want to hear what you have to say to us. Your word's written by your servant Moses, and we just open our hearts to you and want to worship you by being attentive and obedient, and we pray in your name, in the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, a few things before we um, jump into the text. We are going to be in Exodus chapter 15, if you want to turn there, second book of the Bible. Tomorrow, this weekend is Memorial Weekend, tomorrow is Memorial Day where we celebrate people who um, served, um, sacrificed to protect our country, and I'm just curious, who here has been, if you've been in service of any kind of the country and with any of the branch of military, would you stand? We would like to just honor you if you have served in that way. Skip, thank you. Yep, can we, can we let these guys know we appreciate because you were willing to lay it on the line for our country, and God has put us in a, uh, has gifted us with a great place to live, has He not? So, thank you for your service. A um, couple other things. You can bring up that early childhood. We are still really badly in need of help. We have had a few respond to our request for this, but um, we just do not have enough people, and it looks like even next week we're not going to even have the preschool open, that um, children of that age will not even be able to, to be there. And we so badly don't want to do that. We feel like having that children's ministry available, even for that age, is so important, especially for newcomers. So if, if God has been a little bit neg egging you on or knocking on your heart about that, if you're not volunteering or serving in any way at 12th, I really invite you to step into that. We, we're asking a really pretty simple thing that, that once a month, that if you could just attend one service and serve one service, really simple we really badly need help over there. And I know there's been a few people who even have told me um, that they were intending to contact the ministry, and uh, I saw the list the other day, or heard the names, and some of those weren't even on there. So if you haven't done that yet, do it. That's why we have the QR code. You could lift up your phone and do that, but um, we really do need um, the help with those little young ones. They, Jesus loved the little children, right? All the children will, and we want to minister to well to them. Men's study. We're doing a study again this summer. Last summer, I loved that group, 32, 33 men were together. We divided into uh, actually four smaller groups. One was a Thursday, three on Wednesday, and went through Stu Weber's book, Four Pillars, at least the Wednesday night group did. All the guys loved it, and so we felt like we'd do another Stu Weber book. So we're going to start this in two weeks, that first full week of June and really want to encourage the guys here to join this. This is great material. I love the stuff he writes. I've looked through the, I've read some of this book, maybe five chapters of it. You look through the table of contents, it's great stuff. Wives, so many of you long for your husband to lead well and uh, to be the man at home in every way, including spiritually, and 
If you're like, they're not quite there yet, right now is the time to give them a nudge, point them up there, have them hold their phone up, get on that QR code and sign up for that. Um, we have the books in the back, so after the service, grab one of those, even if you don't have the $10, sign up, pick the night, give us your information, and um, we'll get a book to you um, to have. So really encourage you to do that. I was looking to see if I see Lisa Hubner here. I don't. I was going to ask her to do something for me, but that's okay. Um, one more thing. We're still in the names of God, and... We, some people, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago or maybe last week, have been asking for a card or something they can keep in their Bible with all these names so that they can actually use the names of God as they pray. And so those are in, at the printer, and we will have those next week. So we will have those out if that's something that you want. So Exodus 15, we're in the next name of God. It is the last of the Yahweh combo names of a name tied with the I Am. Um, so if you're not in Exodus 15, turn there. Quick. Very quick setup for this. Um, God has just set the people of Israel free from Egypt. They've gone on the trip. He's he's leading them through the wilderness out of Egypt. They've come to the Red Sea where they become trapped. They're at the sea. There's no way to cross it. The Pharaoh and his army come after them to destroy them, and they have no way out. And you know it's one of the greatest miracles of the Bible where God um, uses Moses and his staff to, to separate the sea and create dry land that they walk across. And so that happens in chapter 14. And after they go through and God rescues them, the beginning of chapter 15, is a, they have a praise and worship service and the song, two songs that are sung are recorded there. But then we find ourselves in chapter 15, verse 22. And I want to start with the next story right after this event. So Exodus 15, and I'm going to be reading starting in verse 22. So let's walk through this together. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the desert of Shur. And here is a map of that. It's really hard for you to see, I'm sure, the print on that. But you can see the first three stops um, in Egypt, where they crossed the Red Sea. And now this number four down here, we're going to see in a minute that we're going to be at Marah. Um, you'll see that. So back to verse 22. For three, days, for three days, they traveled in the desert without finding water. And we know from earlier in the story, they're very well provisioned. But three days in the desert, you're going to start running out, right? Very hot and dry, and I'm sure there was fear percolating in all of them. At least it would for me. So verse 23. And by the way, I want to put verse 23 on the screen. So even if you're following in the Bible, which I hope you are. um, But in um, verse, what did I say? Verse 23. I want you to look up here because I want to show you something in this text um, that I think is really important. that's, That's really clear in the Hebrew. And in your English, kind of. But when they came to Marah which in Hebrew is bitter. They could not drink its water because it was bitter, mara. That's why the place is called mara, bitter. So you see that happening three times, and that's really significant. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So suddenly somebody sees water in the distance. I'm sure a bunch of them, they're on a dead run. They get there. The first guy gets there, dips his hand in that water, takes a sip in his mouth, and immediately spews it out because it's rancid, and it's bitter, and it's totally undrinkable. And they're their, their hopes and dreams of finding something um, that, that could quench their thirst goes unanswered. Um, have you ever, I'm curious, picked up a beverage thinking it was one drink and you drank it and didn't find out till you drank it that it was something totally not what you thought? I think we probably, have you all had that experience? We probably all had it. Um, when I was a kid, we would get soda pop. Pop is what we call it in Western Kansas. We get pop like once a month. My, it was usually Pepsi. Sorry, Coke fans, but my mother loved Pepsi. Or 7-Up. And um, one night, I went in the kitchen and my dad was working at the table and I couldn't help but to notice that he had a glass of 7-Up that he was drinking. And I thought, and it wasn't a time we were all going to have it, and I thought I'd like a drink of that 7-Up. So I strategically kind of hung out in the kitchen and waited for him to get up to go to another room to do something. And when he got up, I ran over as fast as I could. I grabbed it, slammed it back, and took a really big gulp. It immediately came out my nose. Uh, I did not know what Alka-Seltzer was till that day when he came in and saw me and the mess that I'd created. And I'm like, Dad, what was that? So, but that's what I had drunk and drank, drank, whatever. That day was, was Alka-Seltzer. The shock, I still can remember very vividly today. I still hate Alka-Seltzer. You ever take Alka-Seltzer cold uh, medicine? It's horrible. But, uh, and this memory always comes back. 
But it, it happened with them. They were, had an expectation of something they thought God was going to provide. They got there, and it wasn't at all what they expected. And have, not, have we not all had that in our life, where we had an expectation, a longing? We thought God would come through, and He didn't. That feeling that you have of like, what's going on? Why are you not meeting my need? And that's what happened with them. They had been on this huge spiritual high, and now they hit rock bottom. And how do they respond? Look at verse 4. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And they did what they normally do, if you know their story, and what we normally do when we don't get what we want, which is they complain. And they had gone from extreme gratitude now to grumbling in just three days, in just three days. These are the same people who three days earlier in a worship service had said this in their song, the Lord is my salvation, who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you've redeemed in your strength. You will guide them to your holy dwelling. The Lord reigns forever and ever. And they had just sung that. And here they are three days later. They had already forgotten. They had already forgotten what he had done. And they're already doubting and they're already grumbling. How like me they are. So verse 25. Verse 25. Then Moses cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water. And the water became fit to drink. So God comes through. He does the miracle. He provides. He shows himself as Yahweh Ira. But it's not over. So back to the rest of verse 25. And we're going to see two things here. And I have it on the screen because I, I want to kind of focus on these for a minute. But verse 25 says, There at Mara, the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them, and he put them to the test. And I feel like I need to talk about both of those. First, I want to talk about the test. I talked about that last week with Abraham, but I promised I'd say more about it today. And again, for me, anytime I encounter this, it's always, it strikes me as negative. That's just my gut reaction because when you grow up, tests are mainly done at school and who likes taking the final exams and all of that. There's a few who like that, but I never cared. I didn't hate them, but I just didn't care for them. But I want to reiterate what I said last week, that tests are not intended He's not putting us through the ringer so he can just watch us squirm and enjoy that. That's not the point. God is a good God and his tests are good. Um, if you were to study education, you would learn that teachers give two kinds of tests. They give what's called a summative test and what's called a formative test. Summative tests, generally speaking, are given um, at the end of the class or a term. Maybe sometimes you'll get a midterm of it. They're high stakes. They're usually pass-fail um, in some classes, the grade is worth so much that if you fail the test, you can actually fail the class. So they're very high stakes. Formative tests, generally speaking, um, are given throughout the term, and they can come in a lot of different forms. The most common form are quizzes. Um, and what they're intended to do is to give me feedback. They're to help me to see maybe where I haven't got, got a concept, where I need to push in a little harder, I need to learn a little more. And the whole point of them is for growth and improvement. They're to help me to, to get better at what I'm doing. That's the intent. They're to form the student, and that's why they're called a formative test. Formative tests are formative in three ways. Uh, and this will apply to the text, trust me. Number one, um, so it's revelation, formation, and preparation. They reveal to me, if I will pay attention, where I need to work. Like, I take an algebra quiz, and if I fail it, I'm like, I need to rework that lesson, or I need to talk to the teacher about that, because I didn't get the concept, obviously. And that's what the formation is. So I'll, I'll go to the teacher after class, and they help me work through it. And the whole point is not just to form me in that skill, but it's also for preparation. Because if you've ever had algebra, you know the next set of skills are dependent upon that skill. And if you don't get this one, you're not getting those. So they're meant to prepare you. And this all really fits with God. And I want you to know that God's tests are formative. Not summative, but they're formative. And so with that under our belt, I just want us to think briefly about this and what God is doing with them here. Um, so he just did 10 huge miracles. He called Moses to, to liberate them. He did 10 huge miracles, the plagues on Egypt, to set them free. The first of those, by, way, by the way, was a water miracle. He turned the Nile into blood. And then they leave Egypt, they come to the Red Sea, and he does another water miracle for them, one of the most amazing miracles in the Bible. And then he brings them to Mara. And God knows it's time to give them a formative test. So that's what he's going to do is give them a formative test. And so he takes them to their second consecutive water problem. Second consecutive water problem. One that's much simpler than less of a crisis than the Red Sea one. 
So I want to walk backwards through those three things that formative tests do, if you don't mind. So first, it's all about preparation. God knows that for them to do the things they're going to have to do, which is wander in the desert for 40 years, to enter into the land, to take the land, to live in the land, they are going to have to have trust in Him. He knows that. So He has to prepare them for that, to develop that. And that's the next one, is that, that, that formation, um, that He needs to form trust in them. And so that's what He's doing at Mara, is He is going to use this thing to help form trust in them. And here's how I think He wished that it would have happened if we had talked to God. I think um, his intent would have been is that they would have put two and two together. That as they came to Mara, they would have initially been scared. We all are, right? But then they would have been like, hmm, didn't God do 10 amazing miracles to set us free from Egypt? The first one being a water miracle. And then he led us out of Egypt. We got set free. And then Pharaoh followed and we're trapped between the Red Sea. But he did another miracle, like a a major miracle. I mean, multiple movies are going to get made about that miracle. And we were actually in it. And we got to see and witness that miracle. And now we have another water problem. If if God can turn water to blood, and if God can split a sea and make it dry so we can walk through it, do you think that he can make bitter water drinkable? I think he actually can. So let's get together and join hands and sing Kumbaya, and let's pray, and let's just ask God to make this water drinkable to us. And they pray, and then God would have answered them, and they would have experienced God in a very profound way. Their trust would have been multiplied exponentially. Does that make sense? I think that's how he desired, would have desired that this would have formed them. Um, but instead, what did they do? Did they trust him? Did they do all of that? Instead of trust, they did what? Yeah, they grumbled and complained. And in doing that, because remember, the other thing that a formative test does is it reveals. It revealed to Moses and to them, if they would have paid attention, it revealed the true nature of their heart and the lack of trust that they had. And that's what God is trying, hoping to get them to reflect on, to learn about themselves, especially their hearts, that they are a bitter, untrusting, complaining group of people, and they need healing in their hearts. And so you see this whole thing, this water thing, was an object lesson for them. That, that bitter water was actually supposed to be to them a mirror of the reality of their hearts, that they were bitter people. That's why, that's why that is on there three times. And if they had thought about it and reflected on it, they would have realized the kind of people they were so they could allow God to form them to not be a complaining, bitter people, but to be a trusting people. So this was all about God trying to build into them trust. And I love that he is so gracious because even though they didn't do the first scenario they offered where they would have put two and two together and trusted him, but they complained that God still took care of the water. He still did the miracle. Is he not good and gracious? I love how he does that because he's forming a people. And despite their lack of faith, he's still building trust in them because he knows they need it. They need to trust that he is great and that he's good, that he will provide that he, pr- he keeps his promises, and they will, he'll meet all of their true needs, the true things they truly need, that he'll meet those needs. Okay, secondly, that's the test. So I want you to know, God's tests are formative. I hope this helps you think differently anytime you encounter that in Scripture. The other thing I want to do is in Exodus 15, 26, the second thing that he did at Marah. After the miracle, he, it was a test, but he also instructed them. And here's the text. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God, if you do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, if you keep all his degrees, decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians. And I just need to speak very briefly to this because some people want to take that and to apply it to my life right now and we can't do that because this was something that was given only to Israel as a nation in the Old Covenant. They're about ready to go to Sinai to make that covenant. It was a covenant with promises and with obligations and conditions. And if they were faithful to him, God promised they would have no plagues, no famines. Nobody um, would invade them. They would not have any of the diseases that Egypt had. That was his promise if they were faithful as a nation. But as you know, Israel was unfaithful. And so God let them have a lot of stuff. We saw that in Judges with Gideon, right? To help turn them back to him. So I I just want to tell you, we cannot take this text and apply it to us. That's why I just want to make that really clear. Okay? But the rest of verse 26. The rest of verse 26. The last eight words of that verse 
He said, um, let me just do 26 again. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God, if you do what's right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands, keep all his degrees, decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. And then verse 27, when they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped, and they camped there near the water. That spring still exists today. This is it. Um, and so at Marah, after the, the formative test, God takes him to Elam. It's his third water provision in a week. Do you think he's not trying to teach them something? His third water provision for them in a week. And he takes them to a place of rest and refreshment and where there's plenty of water to drink for everybody. How many springs does it say were there? Twelve. Is that number significant? Twelve tribes, right? Enough water for all the twelve tribes. The number 70 is significant, but it would take too long to tell you why. Um, but there's 70 palm trees there. But, and it's not just regular water, it's spring water. It's, it's abundant, it's fresh, it's clear, there's plenty for everybody to drink, it's cool and it's refreshing. And again, I love the grace of God that he takes them to Elam after Mara. Because they had not, they had demonstrated what their heart towards him was like, and yet he still takes them to this good place. Because God is full of grace and unconditional love. So, back to verse 26. The most important part of the story. Because here's where God reveals our final name that we're going to do. And it's the last eight words of verse 26. And I've got it up on the screen. Would you read those eight words with me? For I am the Lord who heals you. I am the Lord who heals you. In Hebrew, it literally, it's three words in Hebrew. I am. Yahweh Rapha. I, Yahweh Rapha. That's who I am. In Hebrew, Rapha means to heal, to fix, to mend, or to restore. And so Yahweh Rapha means I am your healer. Is that not cool? Would you say Yahweh Rapha with me? Yahweh Rapha. So at Mara, he gets their undivided attention. And he says, I want to teach you something about me, who I am, and my character. And he reveals there this name, Yahweh Rapha. And he lets them know that his heart is to completely heal. His heart is to completely heal body, soul, and spirit. There's other scripture that speaks to this. In Psalm 41.3, David writes this about God and his people. The Lord sustains them on the sick, their sickbed, and he restores them from their bed of illness. As I was working on this and preparing this, I was thinking, what are the other Old Testament, what are the Old Testament miracles of healing? And I was quite shocked to find that there are only two. I thought there would be more. Other than two stories of a prophet raising a child from the dead, there's only two healings in the whole Testament, Hezekiah and Naaman, only two healings. And I was really shocked. I'm like, if he's Yahweh Rapha, why aren't there more healings happening? Not that I'm doubting that, but I'm just like, why weren't there more? And then I, as I thought about it, because what God was doing in the Old Testament is he was forming a nation, Israel. And from that nation, it would become a model community to all nations who would declare the glory of God to the nations. That was his intent to tell the nations about him. And from Israel would come Messiah. They would be the conduit for the Messiah. So his primary objective in the Old Testament is the forming of this nation. And so most of the miracles in the Old Testament are protecting and providing for the nation. So I thought, okay, that kind of makes sense. And then you come to Jesus and all that radically changed with him, right? Jesus the Messiah, Yahweh Rapha in human flesh, God in flesh. He shows up and healing miracles explode. They explode. So in Matthew 4, 23 to 25, it says this. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. Besides raising three people from the dead, so he won up the whole Old Testament, three people from the dead. We're told that he healed, he healed lepers, he healed the paralyzed, the crippled, he, he healed the blind, um, the deaf, those who were unable to speak. He healed people with seizures. He, pil he healed an individual who had an ongoing, unending issue with blood. He even healed the ear of Malchus, who was one of the men who came to arrest him when Peter cut his ear off. Jesus picks it up and puts it back on and fully restores it. So everywhere he went, Jesus is doing healing miracles. 
We find healing mentioned in the rest of the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 12, 9, it says that one of the gifts Christ gives to his body, the Holy Spirit gives his body, is the gift of healing. In James chapter 5, we're told that if somebody's sick, to call the elders, and the elders will pray over them and anoint over them to pray for their healing. And I've been involved in a number of those. Even before I was pastor here, I was involved in some of those. And I saw some people miraculously healed through that. I also saw some people who weren't. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But I did see God work through that in some powerful ways. And then we come to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which speaks of Jesus' return and of new creation. And here we're told in Revelation 21.4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And anytime I read anything about that new creation, I always say in my heart, come Lord Jesus. Do you not say that? Come Lord Jesus. Now, I've been thinking primarily about physical healing. And I think when we think of healing, that's mainly what we think of. But I want you to know God cares about us in the totality of who we are. In 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul writes, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 3 John, verses 1 and 2, I think this is verse 2. He says, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. I've talked several times about the four key relationships we have. Physical, emotional, spiritual, relational. He cares about all of those and wants to bring his healing power into all those areas of our life. He cares about my spiritual health, my soul. Psalm 23, 2 and 3, speaking of God, David writes, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Or in the language of the King James or the New American Standard, He restores my soul. Or the Aramaic Bible, I love this. He brings back my soul. You ever feel like you're so busy you leave your soul a mile behind? You ever felt that way? You're like, I need to stop for a day and let my soul catch up. That's kind of what that feels like, that, that soul restoration we need at times. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your what? Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And he cares about my emotional health. Psalm 147.3 says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Back in February, remember when we talked about Yahweh Ro? Ro, you get these all mixed up, don't you? Ro, he, I am your shepherd. And we looked at the story of Elijah in his depression after the great spiritual battle and how the angel of the Lord and how God showed up and ministered to his emotional health, actually the totality of who he was. And he cares about my relational health. Speaking of John the Baptist in Luke 1.17, in the age of the Messiah, Gabriel says this, he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. So he cares about that relational health and restoration. So here's the big question. If God and his character is Yahweh Rapha, if he is the healer, then why do we not always see him healing? Why do we not always see him healing? Isn't that not like the elephant in the room right now when I talk about this? I know it's the elephant in the room because I purposely put this one off till very last because I was so intimidated by it because I have so many questions about this that I haven't even answered for myself. You know, why do so many people struggle with illness and infirmity physically, spiritually, emotionally, right? Why do so many struggle and here's my profound answer to that. I don't know. I don't know. It's a mystery. Is it not a mystery? It's a mystery to me. And though it's a mystery, though, I think Scripture gives us some hints and clues. I just want to talk about a few things related to that. You know, if you are seeking Jesus and wanting to know if, if there's historical evidence for his life and his miracles, there's very strong evidence. There is evidence that he did healing miracles. So we know this truly is God's heart. This healing truly is in the center of his heart. But even Jesus didn't heal everybody. 
In John 5, he goes to the pool of Bethesda where there's hundreds of people laying there waiting to get put into the pool for healing, and he only heals one of those people. He heals just one out of hundreds. In 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul is writing to his protege Timothy who has a stomach ailment, and rather than tell him, you know, go seek out somebody to pray healing over you, he says, I drink some wine for your stomach. And even Hezekiah, one of the two Old Testament healing miracles, when he prays for extra years because of this disease and God says, I will extend your life, he tells him to go to the doctor and do some things with figs that they did back then. I don't think doctors use figs much anymore. But he actually told him to use a regular medicinal treatment as part of his healing, okay? You know, sadly, there is a small number of people, Christians, there's not a lot, but there's a small number who claim that full healing is available to every believer today if they will only have enough faith, right? You've seen this on TV, right? You've heard this. And I, ne- I need to speak to that. When I talked about Yahweh Tabaoth and Pinael, um, I talked about, I warned us from this spiritual triumphalism that like if I follow God, I'm going to live this triumphalistic life where everything just goes perfectly, right? Um, and I, it, you can start presuming upon God that you're going to have perfect health if you follow him. And that's, that's the furthest thing from the truth. I mean, the reality is, even if God heals me, I'm still going to die, right? I'm still going to die. This world is not as God intended it and is tragically broken. And so I said it in those two sermons, I'm going to say it again. It is so easy to forget that we live in this time between the times. We live between Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection, where he came as Lord and inaugurated the kingdom, and the time when he will fully return and make everything right. We live in this hybrid time when the kingdom of God has come in. It is very active right now, but the darkness and the brokenness, the corruption of the world is still here. We live in this hybrid time. We live in this already and not yet. So this is part of the answer to that question. And I'm going to throw out kind of a theological few words. The words aren't important, but the concept really is that there are believers who have what's called an over-realized eschatology. And here's what that means. They want to bring everything, the full, final, full new creation reality, they want to bring all of that into now, in their thinking. In their thinking, everything I'm going to have in new creation, I should have now, and God will give me now. But Scripture doesn't teach that at all. Yes, Jesus secured our eventual health and healing on the cross. Isaiah 53 talks about that. And thankfully, He still miraculously heals. There are people in here as I thought about this this week, that I know God has healed, miraculously even. Um, But we will not receive full, final healing, physically, emotionally, spiritually, till we get our new body and new creation. That's just the reality. Until that full and final redemption of the return of Jesus, we will continue to struggle with illness and infirmity, and yes, even death. So, In other words, God does not promise all of us full and complete healing in this life. In this life. Many, maybe most of us will continue to struggle in this life with uncured ailments. Again, physically, emotionally, spiritually. I mean, man, when you get old and your body starts wearing out, do you not feel this? Do you not feel this? So to me, here's the bigger question. Here's the bigger question. How do I live with unresolved pain? And suffering and illness in the here and now. That to me is the bigger question. Biblically, what should my perspective be? How should I think about this? And more importantly, how can I approach my pain and suffering in a way that brings him fame? Those are the more important. I have those questions. Why didn't you heal that person? But these are bigger questions to me. And I can't answer all of those totally. I don't even have time. Um, but can I give you just two rocks that Pat and I, we talked about this many years ago, that I think to, the two rocks for us, that as we try to think about how we live in our own suffering, are two things. Number one, the first rock is this, is that we are fully confident that God is good. We trust his goodness. And so when I can't see his hand, I trust his heart. And the other thing is, is I have to trust in that God is doing bigger things in the world than just Garen, Right? We talked about that with Ruth and Naomi. Naomi called, said, change my name to Bitter, to Mara, because all she could see was her little life and her problems, not knowing that God was going to use her and Ruth to eventually bring Messiah and the redemption of the whole world, that God was doing way more than just her life. And, and just to remind myself that God has bigger fish to fry, not that he doesn't care about me, but he's got other things going on, and I don't know what he's doing for his glory and for his mission. 
To me, a good example of this was Tim Wright when he was going through a very aggressive brain cancer. And he and I would talk many times on his porch, and he would grieve. There was sadness in that. But more than one time, Tim told me with full confidence, he would say, Garen, I would, if, if, if me dying from this and the way I live through this and that funeral, if all of that would bring just one more person to Jesus, then if I live 30 more years, I will take the cancer taking my life because I care more about what God's doing in the world than just my health. Tim had this kind of perspective. I don't know that I could have that perspective, but Tim did. If you're struggling with something right now and you're in need of healing, because all of us are to a degree or another, and if you're needing perspective, I want to offer a really good article and I want to offer two books. The article was written by John Piper called Don't Waste Your Cancer. He wrote this either the night he was diagnosed with cancer or the night of his first treatment. I don't remember. I don't agree with everything he wrote. There's a sentence or a phrase or two or one word I would change, but the whole thing is excellent. And if you're struggling physically, emotionally, especially he's talking about cancer, but it's worth the read. It's really good. Won't take you but five minutes. Two books that are excellent. K.J. Ramsey wrote this book, This Too Shall Last. I love that title because people throw around cliches all the time. You know, you've got cancer. Oh, this too shall, what do we say? This will pass. I mean, in in eternity it will, but not in this life sometimes, right? Um, People don't need to hear that cliche. So I love how she tweaks that. Um, I have not read this book, but somebody I implicitly trust who went through her own cancer struggle, very, just a lot of deep, suffering and pain and a lot of things recommended this. And I just, I looked on Amazon the other day and I just want to read the descriptor to this book. Our culture treats suffering like a problem to fix, a blight to hide, or the sad start of a transformation story. We silently, secretly wither under the pressure of living as though suffering is a predicament we can avoid or annihilate by having enough faith. When your prayers for healing haven't been answered, the fog of depression isn't lifting or grief won't go away, it's easy to feel you failed God or worse, that he's failed you. If God loves us, why does he allow us to hurt? Over a decade ago, chronic illness plunged therapist and writer K.J. Ramsey straight into this paradox. Before her illness, faith made sense. But when pain came and never left, K.J. had to find a way across the widening canyon that seemed to separate goodness from her excruciating circumstances. She wanted to conquer suffering. Instead, she encountered the God who chose it. She wanted to make pain past tense. Instead, God invited her into a bigger story. This too shall last last offers an antidote to our cultural idolatry of ease. Uh, I'm going to read it. Just that. I'm like, this sounds really good. The other one is Kelly M. Capick. Um, who is actually at Duke University, and I'm pretty sure Carissa has met her, and same thing, st- encountered, and still struggles with a very chronic, painful, ongoing disease, and through that wrote this book. So if, if you're needing perspective on suffering, especially physical suffering, I just want to offer those to you. So, okay, we are going to watch a video clip from The Chosen. Um, how many of you have seen The Chosen, at least part of it, have watched it? Yeah, it's really good. Um, I highly recommend it. And the clip we're going to see involves little James, one of the 12 followers. And in the clip, okay, and a lot of what's happening in The Chosen, it's based upon the Bible generally, but a lot of what they're putting in it is stuff that's not in the Bible. So that's not the, the, they're not saying this literally happened, okay? In, in the movie, little James was born with a disability. And you're going to see him have a conversation with Jesus, Um, after Jesus has called the 12, he's going to send them on mission to talk about the kingdom and to heal. And little James comes up and wants to talk to him about that. And it's really powerful. And I just think so much of it just smells of the Bible and of the gospel. And it's really powerful. So I want you to watch this. If you're at home, by the way, because we're doing this on YouTube, you're not really going to be able to see it. It's season three, episode two. If you want to watch it, it's almost at the end of that episode. Just hang with us um, through it. We'll be back after this video.
Would you stand? Verse 12, we serve and we love a God whose name is Yahweh Rapha. I am your healer. A God who is fully able to restore and bring wholeness to anything that's broken or that's ill, that's infirm, emotionally, physically, spiritually, in any way. And I love how he finished that, how he said, just hold on a little longer. Hold on a little longer. You will be healed. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. So we're going to end with a song of worship, and we also want to give a chance for response, that if, if there is an area in your own life where you're feeling the need of wholeness and of God's healing touch, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual, relational, we want to invite you, if you feel the need to come up, there's a, these papers up here, people came up for service, and you can write things in just to pray and give that to the Lord. Um, feel free, to, I mean, ask Him to bring healing to that thing. And then just turn that over and give that to His good hand. Or maybe there's somebody you really care about who's struggling with something. That's what mine was. Um, that seems incurable, that's not going away. And you want to come up and pray for them. I have some people willing to pray. Um, you don't. You can just come up and do this on your own. If you're here and willing to pray, come on up. We well, we just wanted to make available that if you feel like you need prayer, that you could have that. Um, I know the McCrories are going to be up here in a minute. So if you need prayer, if you just want to take it to the Lord, come up. If you need prayer, go to them. So let's um, let's take a minute and we want to we want to worship the Lord. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see? Slave. 
every people and tribe, every nation and tongue. He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? wants to come up and pray even after feel free to come up and do that and I know Brent and Melissa will still be up here uh, they prayed with somebody after the service is over in first service so we just invite you to come up and do that um, guys if you want to be in the men's group the books are in the back go back there sign up now and take one with you uh, amen we've got somebody already ready to sign up so let me pray us out father thank you for the reality that you are Yahweh Rapha that you are a healer that your desire your heart's desires are wholeness in the totality of who we are. And there's so many areas we just feel broken and we're so utterly dependent upon you. Um, just whatever the deep needs are here, Lord, I just pray that you would meet those needs. And I long for new creation when you'll make everything well once again. And so we just pray in the name of Jesus, our healer. Amen. So 12th, you are sent. <laughs>